Hi, my name is Bob Narstad, and I've uh, been a part of Clark for about 15 years. I've had a great opportunity to meet many of you over the years, and we've had some experience learning more about LED walls and thought we'd share that with you. Uh, some of the things that we've found over the last couple of years, uh, there's a lot of uh, information, misinformation, noise in the marketplace about what makes a great LED wall or a good LED wall or a bad LED wall. So we thought we'd share that with you because many of our customers are coming to us now as the marketplace has been able to bring the price point of LED display technology down. More and more people are seeing them as a viable option for some of the projection display in their auditoriums and for use in their staging and scenic opportunities. So today we're gonna to talk about the different things that make up the components of an LED wall. We'll talk about the frames, uh, the electronics that are on them, how they're put together, the things to look for, how you set them up. We'll talk about processing and how you get your video signal from your video control room or your cameras or your graphics display into the LED wall, get it all on a display. And we'll talk about things that people are commonly looking for, about what they're looking for and how to decide what LED wall they want. But I'm also going to add in a little bit of the things that we found that we need to be looking for that aren't talked about quite that often. Um, and we'll talk about some common issues that people find. So LED walls are made up of individual panels. They get assembled together with mechanical constructions and they're either ground supported or they're flown from the air. One of the things that we found is you have to be careful to understand that if you're going to ground support an LED wall, if you see in the picture on the right, it always takes some space behind the LED wall to support it. When you're setting up an LED wall on the ground, we have to make sure that we have enough room behind the LED wall to ballast it to keep it from falling forward. They can be extremely heavy and the higher you go and the larger the display, the heavier that weight is and it wants to pull forward. So we need some space to ballast it in the back. Another thing that we wanna look for when we're setting up a ground stack is to be very careful that you're buying a manufacturer's product that has a very good, solid, rigid support base. And when you install that support base, you wanna make sure that you're installing it on a stage or a platform that can hold the weight and not allow the ground support system to come out of balance. If the ground support system gets out of balance, the LED panels themselves will start to get shifted to a point where one panel is higher than the other. And if this happens to you early on in your installation, if you get out of balance on those panels, even a small, in this screen, these panels are 2.9 millimeter pitch LEDs. So we tend to think that the tolerance that you have for having an LED not match is less than a third of the millimeter pitch of the LED. So on this one with a 2.9, we have to go probably less than half a millimeter. If we get more than a half a millimeter out of alignment, as the taller we go up in that display, the more that alignment will become exaggerated and become a serious problem. The other way that, and the most common way that LEDs are being assembled today is to fly them in the air. This is a lot easier to do. We still have the same situation where we have to be careful to make sure that we're supporting the LED evenly as its weight gets distributed across the horizontal support so that none of the individual panels, that there's no sag or flex or bow in the support system. So oftentimes you'll find that the LED manufacturers provide a rigging bar and we'll take that rigging bar and accentuate it with a piece of rigging steel and then we'll support that rigging bar approximately every foot and a half to two feet from that uh, support steel so that we can use things like turnbuckles and other tensioning items to make sure that we don't have any bow or flex in there. The main components of the LED wall are the frame and the modules and the power hub. And we'll talk about the frames. They come in a variety of different manufacturing materials. The majority of them that you'll see are made out of cast aluminum. It's a relatively white, lightweight metal that has a lot of rigidity and gives the manufacturers the ability to assemble them easily. One of the new materials that we've seen a lot of, especially for customers who want to take their LED and use it in a, a staging situation or a scenic element where they're going to be taking that maybe apart uh, set up, take down, redeploy modules in different configurations. We're seeing uh, manufacturers deploy them in a magnesium alloy. One of the great things about the magnesium is it's extremely lightweight relative to the cast aluminum, makes it a lot easier to come up with different configurations. The frame sizes are pretty standardized. The majority of the LED walls that we've seen our customers ask us about, the majority of manufacturers, have standardized in a 500 millimeter by 500 millimeter square panel. Um, 
Additionally, though, when we're doing LED displays for uh, broadcast systems where we're replacing traditional IMAG projection screens or center screens or things that are going to be used as displays where we're taking a video signal from a camera, graphic systems, production system, and we're doing it especially when it's an install system, we're seeing a lot of true 16 by 9 uh, aspect ratio displays come out. This ends up being very helpful. If we try to build a 16 by nine display, let's say it's exactly 16 feet wide by nine feet tall. If we try to do that with 500 by 500 millimeter square panels, we end up in a situation where if we fill the display out top to bottom, we end up with small black bars on the sides. Or if we fill it up side to side, we're actually over scanning the top and the bottom because a 500 by 500 millimeter square panel, when we combine them, you're never gonna get a true 16 by nine aspect ratio. So these manufacturers have helped us out by providing that those panels in true 16 by 9. One of the last uh, panel sizes that we've seen is this 1,000 millimeter tall by 500 millimeter wide. It's really just two of the 500 by 500s built into a single cast frame. That allows the manufacturer to assemble it in a and make it less expensive for you because you're buying less panels. However, you do have to keep in mind that these are typically only used for permanent install situations where it's not gonna be taken apart and we don't really need the flexibility for doing scenic or other kinds of creative deployments. When it comes to servicing, the uh, panels. There's really only two ways we do it. One is called the full rear service. And you can see that on the panel in the picture here, uh, we can get access to those small handles, which are the back of the modules. We'll talk about modules in a little bit. And they have retaining clips and we can get in and, and access both the panel or the module and replace the module. That's when the pixels go out, we replace modules. But we also have access to what's called the power hub. Also gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. And inside the power hub are things like power supplies, and receiver cards. So if you need to get access, here's how we take apart the front module is we just release these retaining clips and then we can push forward. But if we want to have 100% front access, a lot of customers are asking us, I want to replace my existing projection screen with an LED wall. I don't want the LED wall to be assembled or, or rigged you know, off the wall. I don't want to have to have two to three feet for somebody to get in behind to change parts. So they want it front accessible. A lot of manufacturers will claim that their LEDs are front accessible. What they're really talking about is the ability to change the module with the pixels. So for example, if you have a bad pixel, you can walk up to the display, use either a magnetic tool or a vacuum tool and be able to remove the module and replace it. What they're not telling you though, is that the display may or may not be 100% front accessible. If you know that your display needs to be mounted up against the wall and you're not gonna have room for people to be able to get in and service from behind to be able to get access to the power supply or the receiver card or the hub card, you need to make sure that your panels are 100% front accessible. And that means we can get access to all the components. We talked about some of the components being modules. This is an LED module. It's usually a square. There are usually in a 500 by 500 millimeter square panel, there are four of these modules. The modules contain the applied surface mounted diodes. Those are the things that actually make the light, the red, the green, and the blue light. We'll talk about diodes in a little bit more detail. And the back of the module, what you can't see is on the inside of the module, are what are called driver ICs, and there's also other circuitry. Those are, print, those are assembled onto the thing called the printed circuit board. Let's talk about the SMD, or surface mounted diode. There's really two kinds that are on the marketplace right now. The most traditional is called the three-in-one, where the LED manufacturer takes three LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue, and assembles them into what's called a package. These packages are what you see when you look up closely at an LED display. The package contains the three LEDs and they get illuminated. They get painted on a black substrate and then they get applied onto the modules. They're usually around two millimeters by two millimeters tall, regardless of the millimeter pitch. Millimeter pitch we'll talk about in a little bit later. A new one is called four in one or chip on board. This is a new kind of LED that actually takes four packages and puts them into a single new larger package. This allows the LED manufacturers to get down into some of the more fine pitch, everything below two millimeters, 1.9, 1.3, and even up to 0.9, are typically starting to be done in four-in-one. It's easier for the machines to assemble the panel, 
and it allows the manufacturer to assemble, put those chips on the board and then cover them in an epoxy resin. It makes them a lot more durable. One of the things that happens a lot with fine pitch LEDs as we go down below two millimeters is during the assembly process, the LEDs can get dented or damaged or picked off of their substrate. And the four in one chip on board prevents that from happening. The other component that's on the uh, module are what are called the printed circuit boards. These are the things inside and they contain all the chips. The chips are commonly referred to as driver ICs or driver integrated circuits. There's other chips as well, but the driver IC is the most important one. We'll talk about driver ICs as we get later on too. The last thing to talk about in the main components is the thing called the power box. The power box is usually in the center of the rear of the assembly and contains the power supply, a component called the receiver card, and another component called a hub card, which takes the receiver card, takes the video signal coming from the senders, we'll talk about that when we get into processing, and distributes it to the four modules. The hub card is what connects those four modules to the receiver card. The last thing when we talk about physical construction of an LED is the choices that you'll have as you go out to look for LEDs are the types of cabling that are used. The most traditional cabling uses a power cable and a data cable that connects every panel together. So you'll bring, for example, a main data and a main power cable to a panel, and then you'll daisy chain those panels to consecutive panels to make up a system. One of the new ways that manufacturers are trying to drive down the price, especially for permanent installed displays, is the use of what's called a cable-free topology. And this is where you'll bring the main data cable for a series of displays, plug that into the first one, and then the internal mechanisms of the frame pass the data and power signal onto the next in the sequence without having to have individual cables. And the last one are manufacturers who are providing you opportunity, sometimes called a universal display, to use the display either in a cable-free manner or in a cabled manner, or you can even mix and match both of them. How are LEDs processed and how do we get the picture from our source video onto an LED screen? We'll start with the source video. This can, is usually either an HDMI signal, you can come right out of a computer, right out of a camera, right out of some playback device, and connect it right into this, to the LED system. Oftentimes, in our customers, we see an, H, an SDI signal coming out of the production system. Maybe the LED panel or display is a router destination or an aux destination on a switcher, or maybe the switcher output, the primary switcher output's going directly to the LED wall. LEDs, because of their nature, where we're running in a variety of different pitches, maybe 3.9 millimeter pitch from center to center, maybe a 2.6, maybe a 2.9, the actual resolution is oftentimes less than the native 1920 by 1080 that our video systems make. So for example, you might have a, a display that's 1,280 pixels wide and 768 tall. It's a 16 by 10-ish aspect ratio, but it's not the same as the 1920, 1080 that your video systems are running. So we need to scale that image. So we'll use a scaler to do that. Then the scaler will plug into what's called a sender box. And the sender box converts the uh, the video coming in, which is usually done either via DVI, DisplayPort, or HDMI to connect the scaler to the sender box, converts that into data. It's a serial data stream that's run over usually some type of category cable, category five, category six, and multiple of those cables then will go to the display or technically to the receiver cards, and we'll talk more about that later. So in scaling, there's a couple different types of scalers that we can use. The first ones are called standalone scalers. Many of you are used to that. This is is, uh, products from Barco, everything from the Image Pro series to the S3, E2, um, TV1, uh, TV, lots of people make scalers. So their function is to take the input and either change the input type from SDI to HDMI and to change the scale. There's also display scaler switchers. This would be things like the S3 or the E2 from Barco. And these can actually be used to scale an input, multiple inputs to multiple outputs, and switch those inputs onto your LED screen in real time. If you're building complicated LED display systems that have multiple displays that integrate together, these are solutions that you'll wanna look at. The standalone sender unit the scalers will hook up into a sender. The sender's job is to take the video and output it 
to the serial data that the LED receiver cards use. They'll usually have one input and multiple outputs, and we'll see some of that in the wiring a little bit later. We combine the sender boxes with the scalers to make a system. And the last one is what the manufacturers now are calling all-in-one, where they're combining the scaling function and the sender function into one unit. So for example, the Nova Star, Nova Pro HD, which is a 1920 by 1080 sender scaler, or their UHD Junior, which does up to 4K. Another one is called from a company called Brompton. And Brompton, we might talk a little bit about this in a little bit more detail later, they have come up with an integrated system of the scalers and receiver cards, the scaler and the processing in the scaler to do a lot of really cool functions. So that's how the LED walls are set up and how they're put together. Now, when people come to us and talk about wanting to purchase or look into deploying LED walls, there's some usual things that they talk to us about, and I call these the usual suspects. Those are things like pixel pitch and refresh rate and the type of input signals that they'll handle. So we'll talk about each of these independently. The pixel pitch, most common pixel pitches right now are what we call the standard pixel pitches. And pixel pitch is the distance between the center of one LED package and the center of the next package next to it. And they typically are in the two to three millimeter range. The most common right now are 2.5 to four. The fine pitch is anything less than that 2.5. And those are used for like conference room, board rooms, control room displays, things like that. The things to look for when you're picking a pixel pitch are in my auditorium, high of a pixel pitch can I go before people in the auditorium are going to be able to resolve the picture? How clear will it look? And so the way we determine that are some standard rules of thumbs. The actual math, the standard for visual acuity, which is called 2020 in the United States, is the ability to discern two points separated by one arc minute. Now that's kind of complicated. It's more physics than I learned in high school, and hashtag math is hard. So what do we do? We combine that down to a general rule of thumb, because that formula roughly equals, equals 10 feet for every one millimeter of pitch, or one millimeter pitch for every 10 feet of the viewer's distance. So for example, if I had a 3.9 millimeter pitch LED wall, after about 40 feet of viewing distance, the viewers aren't gonna be able to resolve the pixels. So if I, my minimum distance between my closest viewer and the LED wall is less than 40 feet, there's no reason that I need to uh, pay for the excess resolution of getting a 2.9, 2.6, or lower resolution wall. However, a lot of the viewers might be a little bit closer. So finding that average viewer and balancing the cost of the additional fine pitch is something that we always talk about with our customers. So we really have to think about our viewer distance. Also, Pixel pitch will have an impact on what is called the moray defect or moray artifact that happens with cameras. And we're gonna talk some more about that later on. The LED draws video in lines. So this is called the refresh rate. And the refresh rate measures how many times per second is every pixel in the LED wall refreshed. Cameras also take pictures in lines. So the refresh rate comes into play when you're picking an LED that's gonna be on cameras. If the shutter rate of the camera is faster than the refresh rate of the LED, you're gonna be able to see different kinds of lines. So on this screen, I've got some examples of what happens when your refresh rate on your LED wall is too slow. There's a rough rule of thumb that we want the refresh rate of the LED to be at least 10 times the refresh rate of the camera that we're using, and, or the shutter speed actually, not necessarily just the refresh rate of the camera. So if most of our cameras are running our shutter speeds at 1 100th to 1 200th, then we wanna have an LED wall that's about 2000 Hertz or 3840. We typically recommend that most are 3840. The balance you have to balance with that is higher refresh rates will generate more heat and they'll also have a detrimental impact on grayscale that we talked about later in the presentation as well, especially at low brightness. So stand by for more on that. Most of the displays that we recommend are 3840 and we'll just deal with the heat and some of the other things that come with them. The input signals, these are things that we talk about. We have HDSDI in our broadcast uh, systems. So we wanna have HDSDI go to our system. Now normally most actual LED sender boxes don't accept SDI. Some of the integrated all-in-ones do, but most of them will use HDMI and we'll use those connectors there. Another thing that we look at is the type of input signals that the system will have. Most of our broadcast systems or IMAG systems in our church auditoriums that are used for feeding these displays, 
take in SDI input. So we'll make sure that we have a scaler that can convert the SDI to the HDMI that the display sender box is gonna use. You can also directly feed LED sender boxes with what are called Visa type outputs. It's HDMI, DVI, and DisplayPort. They're harder to cable over long distances and larger displays might be better suited for some of this. Uh, it depends on your pixel mapping and things like that. You may want to consider using something like a Spider or an E2 or an S3 to help out with that. Those are the things that we look for that most of the customers are pretty knowledgeable about asking about and we'll talk a lot about in the early times. But we want people to know that some of the things that we've learned is there are the usual suspects like pixel pitch and refresh rate, but there's also things that are not so usual that a lot of people don't know and we wanted to talk about those today. Those are called the scan types, the receiver card features, and the LED conductor type. The scan type we found is one of the most important things in determining the quality, especially of the grayscale or low brightness images in an LED wall. The scan type is determined by something called the driver IC, driver integrated circuit. You can't see these chips, they're on the inside of the module, and they're used to manage what's called the multiplexing. An LED panel has too many pixels to have one driver IC per pixel. So the manufacturers have found a way to have one driver manage a series of pixels. This is usually expressed in a fraction, one over some number, one over 11, or one over 29. You can see it when you log into the system's processing software and interrogate the chip. It represents the number of pixels that an individual driver is responsible for. For example, if my number is one over 11, that means that that chip is responsible for addressing 11 pixels. If it's one over 21 or 29, that chip is responsible for addressing that number of pixels. The lower the fraction, the better. That means that that chip has to handle less number of pixels. And this gets important when we start to turn the picture down. Many people, if you've deployed an LED wall now, you know we don't run them at 100% of their brightness. They end up being so bright that people have to wear sunglasses in the auditorium. So we turn the brightness down. When we do that, we're impacting how these drivers impact the pixels. We call this the real refresh rate. Because if we take the number of the refresh rate, 3840, for example, and divide it by the number of, by the scan type, so for example, one over 11, we know that every pixel is getting updated 349 times a second. But if we take that same 3840 and divide it by 21, if that driver chip has to do 21 pixels, then we're only getting a third the type of actual real refresh rate. Manufacturers have learned that they can use this as a way to drive down to uh, try to get better performance by adding more drivers and having a lower scan rate, but they also use this to lower their costs, not yours. So it's typically not something you can see with the human eye, but it usually always shows up on the camera, especially in the low brightness that I'm gonna talk about later as well. The receiver cards. Receiver cards are the brain of every panel. They typically have one per panel. The most common receiver cards are from Novstar and Brompton, and they determine the feature set. So for example, Novastar has a series that they call the Armor Series. The majority of LED displays in the market will be used with the Novastar A4, which is an older, it's a very good receiver card, but doesn't have as many features as the new A8S and the A10S, which is what we usually recommend for our customers. Brompton makes their own receiver cards and they integrate these very closely with their own sender scalers. So they have a lot of cool little magic tricks that they can play. One of those is called the dark magic, which they use in low brightness. We'll have a slide on that and some other features. So receiver cards are very important to the functions that you're gonna get, the ability to handle low picture levels, grayscales, banding, things like that. We'll talk about that when we're talking about the common issues. The last unusual suspect that we talk about with our customers is an esoteric component called the LED bonding conductor. If I show you the picture of these three LED packages, the one on the far left and the one on the far right, those are both two millimeter by two millimeter LED packages. They both have a red, a green, and a blue LED in them. They both make the same amount of light. Can you tell by looking at them what's different about them? Most people can't because what's different about them is on the inside. The one on the left uses what's called a gold LED bonding connector, conductor. The one on the right uses a copper LED bonding connector. And these LED bonding conductor conductors are used to connect the actual LEDs to their power source. 
Gold is much more heat resistant. Some people argue that copper is actually a better electrical conductor. That jury is still out. But gold is definitely more heat resistant. It's also not as brittle. So when your LEDs get older and they are moved around and set up and taken down, or as you turn them on, turn them off, over time, heat is the enemy of LED displays. What happens is that the bonding conductor gets hot, it gets brittle, and eventually will fail. And this leads to failed pixels. Now, you're probably not gonna notice this when you first start up your LED wall. You might not even notice it for a year or two. But after about a year or two, when more and more of your LED pixels start failing, that's a result of choosing potentially a copper LED bonding conductor versus a gold. The challenge is that there is an associated price tag that comes with the gold LED bonding conductors. So those are the things that make up the actual LED components. What are some of the common issues that we see when we are deploying these? The first one is called latency. And latency is the delay between the source, typically a worship leader, a band, guitar player, drummer, or a pastor giving a message on the stage. In the image on the screen, you can see that there's an LED in the background and the presenter in the foreground. And the presenter has lifted her hand and making a point, but on the LED, her hand hasn't been raised yet. That's how latency shows up in LED displays. If you have a drummer and people hear the drum beat, but they see the drummer hit the drum late, if the pastor raises his hand, but it doesn't raise up for a fraction of a second later on the screen, that's visual latency. Another type of latency that we have is called lip sync latency. And latency is a result of the processing time that it takes for our scalers, our senders, and our receiver cards, and our driver ICs to put that picture together. In calculating latency, we try to figure out how many frames of latency we have. And typically, we'll have a frame of latency for the scaler, a frame or two of latency for the sender and the receiver card, maybe even up to three with the combination of those two, and the driver IC. So we can typically count on about having about four, millisecond, four frames of latency. We've calculated that a frame of latency takes about 16 milliseconds. Um, we do that by dividing the one full second or a thousand milliseconds by the 60 frames of, per second of video. We end up with about 16 milliseconds per frame. So if we have a four frame latency in our system, we're gonna have 64 milliseconds of latency. Now there's been some studies done and most people can't detect latency until well after 16 milliseconds, unless we're talking about lip sync and that's a whole other deal. Live productions though, have a visual reference point. For example, I can see both the subject on the stage and their image on the LED wall. So some of that math comes into, into play. What we can do is find systems that have what are called low latency features. And these depend on the sender and the receiver card. The Novastar 660 Pro and the 4K, as well as the Nova Pro UHD, when we combine them with the A8S and the A10S receiver cards, we can, we can bring that latency down. So this chart shows us that the standard system, we've got a frame of latency in the receiver card, two frames in the receiver card, and one in the driver IC. So we have three to four frames of latency, so about 64 milliseconds. But if we turn on the low latency features in these components, so we have to make sure we buy the components that have low latency features, and again, that's the Novastar 660 Pro and the UHD Pro, then we can reduce that from three to four down to two or three. The variance between three and four and two and three is really subject to the driver IC. Some driver ICs have extremely low latency rates, but most have about one. If we have both senders and receiver cards that support low latency features, then we can turn those on and we can get our latency down to one to two frames. That puts us within the 34 millisecond tolerance of human visual acuity. Some issues we gotta watch out for, if we wanna turn low latency features on, we have to make sure that we're not genlocking the system because otherwise the system has to wait for the genlock pulse to happen. And we also can't use other esoteric features like mirroring, et cetera. 
One of the biggest thing about deploying low latency features is that the cabling that we do inside the LED wall when we assemble it is very important. We have to make sure that we don't do any more than 512 pixels wide when we do the cabling. So I've got some examples of ways that we can do that. It's something that our teams do when we uh, design the systems to make sure that we can take advantage of the low latency signals. We also have to make sure that the input is 1080p or better because the low latency systems don't want to have to wait to deinterlace the signal. But we can do that deinterlacing inside the scalers. What are some common problems that we see in deploying LED wall? One of the biggest is the grayscale problem. And this is created because LEDs use driver ICs that use a technology called pulse width modulation, PWM. It just is a fancy way of saying on and off, on and off. The lower our grayscale is, when an LED goes to make light, the way it can make bright light is by turning on many, many times per second. When it wants to make a darker light or more black, it just turns that LED on less often per second. So we have less on pulses. Well, when we do that, we can end up with a color shift and it's usually to red. So lots of customers, when they go to turn the LED brightness down because out of the box they're too bright, they'll start to notice that the LEDs can shift to red. It can also lead to what's called banding and rolling shutter. One of the problems that we run into with grayscale at low brightness is the concept of banding. And banding is when the driver IC cannot turn the LEDs on often enough at a consistent rate throughout the picture. So in the picture you see on the screen, we've highlighted some places that as the picture moves from black to white, where the transition is not consistent. The reduction in banding, because it can never really truly be eliminated in low brightness LEDs, is impacted by the selection of the driver IC, and that's decided by your integrator, the person selling you the LED, and the manufacturer, and the receiver card choices. And we can talk, we'll talk more about that as we keep going. Banding can show up not only in dark parts of the picture, but it can show up in brighter parts of the picture. One of the features that are in the receiver card choices, they have individual uh, brand names for how they address this. Novastar calls it 18-bit plus grayscale correction. It may be hard to see on your screen, but this picture has some banding in it, especially in the low brightness images. And if we turn on that feature, which is only available in the A8S or A10S receiver card, then we can see how it corrects the image. This is another screen showing both of those side by side. Here's another image with the 18-bit grayscale plus grayscale. You can see in the image on the left where the dark levels are actually lifted. Um, and on the right side, the correction lowers the gamma and corrects for the banding and gives a more HDR-like appearance to the picture. Brompton has a brand name for this as well. They call it Dark Magic. It's a combination of their R2 receiver card and their sender boxes. And you can see in the picture, if it's not enabled, as the light comes from the bright source and transitions into the darkness, it has some banding. And if we apply that correction, you can see in the picture on the right that the uh, banding is eliminated. So again, picking the correct receiver card and sending system for your application is important. Another thing that happens when we turn LED walls down because they're too bright is they can cause on-camera rolling shutter artifacts. Peter talked in his presentation about CMOS cameras and single chip cameras and how they use the concept of rolling shutters to capture the image. What happens is that as the camera is taking the picture in a rolling shutter camera, it's taking the picture a band at a time. And the camera shutter and the LED refresh interfere with each other. And they end up with these dark lines throughout the picture, dark or bright. Uh, they may end up being. They're extremely annoying. If you don't have the right sender card and more specifically the right driver IC inside the LED wall, they'll be very hard to get rid of. It's caused by the PWM, the pulse width modulation driver, and the camera scan frequency shows up as the dark lines. And it's especially noticeable if you're panning and especially panning up and down. So they can be reduced by choosing the right driver IC and processor, but they're never completely gone, especially with rolling shutters. And yes, all your Blackmagic cameras are rolling shutter cameras. So to fix this, we'll use global shutter cameras, we'll choose quality components, and we'll choose LEDs with superior processing. The next common artifact we see is the concept of a Moray artifact. It's really an optical artifact. There's nothing we can do in the design of the LED to solve it, but we can help it by solving it optically. We can get the LED out of focus. We can buy finer pitch LEDs. 
Um, if we defocus the LED with some receiving card features, Novastar calls their receiving card feature Clearview, and it actually makes the picture a little bit fuzzier, which helps eliminate the moiré on the LED. We can also cover it with a material like a rear projection material and diffuse the light. One of the other things we have to look for in designing and deploying LED walls is what's called colorimetry, or their ability to reproduce colors. Our broadcasting systems that we've designed over the last 20 years have standards for what colors, what color red, what color green, what color blue is. And we wanna make sure that our LED wall can reflect those standards. LEDs are naturally saturated. That means that they make the reds and the blues and the greens at very deep colors. You can see on this screen is a capture of an actual LED that we deployed before having it calibrated. And you can see that the red is way outside the Rec. 79 triangle, and so is the green. This will end up with people's skin tones looking unnatural. Sometimes I like to say like Oompa Loompas from Willy Wonka. This is fine if the signal you're sending is calling for a saturated red. If I send a signal, an 8-bit 255.00 for red in Rec. 709, I want it to land in the dot on the triangle. I don't want it to be way outside in a saturated red. If we measure accurately calibrated displays, like this image here, we see the reds land in the Rec. 709 triangle, and we see that the balance between the red, green, and the blue throughout the grayscale are even. The correct color response should look like this. So how do we correct this saturated color? Some people have learned to just live with it. Other people want their pictures and the people on stage to look like people. So we can correct this in the sender box. We can use calibration tools to measure the response of the LED and correct for them using the tools that are available to us. We can use specialized products like a LUT box that takes a lookup table approach to correcting the video. If you use something like Brompton, they have what's called on-screen color correction where they can identify a color and actually manipulate it to be any color that you want. So the ability to correct for good skin tones and good color reproduction is enabled based on the system that you buy. One of the projects that we worked on with a customer was working to calibrate their LED. These two images on the screen are actually of two different screens. The one in the foreground is a 24 inch reference monitor from Panasonic. The one in the background is actually a nine foot tall, 16 foot wide LED screen. The difference in the sizes is just basically on the perspective of which one is closest to you. But I wanted you to see that we were able to correct the LED wall to accurately re reproduce all the colors that a very expensive reference monitor could um, inside the lab. So we found ways to be able to correct those things. So our conclusion here is that not all LEDs are created equal. You need to know what you're buying and who you're buying it from. You need to understand your application. Are these LEDs gonna be on camera? Is the LED gonna be in the camera shot? Is it a part of our scenic system? Do I need to pay for the better driver ICs, better receiving cards, and better processing? Am I gonna take down and set it up? Do I wanna look at the magnesium alloy because that makes it easier on us? Do I want a 16 by nine screen so I don't have any artificial scaling and uh, aspect ratio conversion? I'm Bob Narstadt. I've been a part of Clark for 15 years, and I'm really glad that we were able to do this during this extraordinary time in our country, and we hope to see you all very, very soon. Thank you very much. Have a great day.